golf ball, with 25 related. 25 now is on a soldier, and I think he shoot on his own teammate or a different unit that I team. So my team and I said that design a system and hardware to help reduce 25 and system. Now, the original project that we had from Smith Design 1 used a lot of modules and subsystems just so we could have a concept. So this semester we wanted to tackle the idea of putting all that for concept and all the feedback from Smith Design 1 to create a final product. Then we found out that for concept, the module that we pick, first the engine uh, controller wasn't fast enough to handle the amount of programming we had done, and the wireless modules we were using for a company called NODAC. The IDE to program it was going to be very expensive, but we had to pay out of pocket to use it. So we had to design our own hardware with our own software, design our own hardware system, and pretty much start from scratch. So this project really pushed the limit of our engineering <laughs> education. It tested all aspects of our undergraduate degree. First, we had to learn how to design some hardware on the MSU 430. Then we had to program the MSU 430. Then we had to write the code to program the MSU 430. Then we had to learn about our design system and create uh, circuit mounted antennas that had a range between 300 megahertz and 1200 megahertz. And then we had to create a user interface and create an executable so the user would be able to program the system and the field. Now, the brain of this project is a TI MSB430. We also use a TI transceiver, a CC1101. And we also use a TI I amplifier, a CC1190. And we also use a TI battery charger, linear regular. As you can tell, we're like TI devices. And then we have to learn to put all that together and try to have it work. So this project really, really tested our skill sets and to make it semi-functional. At this point, I want to introduce my fellow teammate. To my right is Quincy. He did most of the heavy lifting on the software programming and the C code and MSP, digging to the spectrum and understanding to make it work. Next to him is Lindy. She's the second hardware engineer on the team. She worked on the build of the material, the user guide, the user manual, the financial cost analysis. And to her right is Nash. This really had a mechanical engineer on this team, so Nash was it. <laughs> He did the 3D model and the case design and the prototype to make it how it would look and the real life. And next to Nash is Aloha, who was the second software engineer on the team. She did the user interface and live view and make it a sound executable so the team can use it on their laptop and the field and be able to program and reset the device. At this point, I will open the question. Would you trust this device as it is now? It's, it's having some packet issues. Because, because right now we have some interference and it's not working exactly as we have expected. But because it's so crucial in such a limited application, that's one of the main things we're trying to get extremely reliable so that it will work on first use. So you know, the turn on, program it, is ready to go. Yes, I used to be military, I used to be in the army, and I would choose one like this, and I would want to have this device so that I would not shoot my parents in it. So is it replacing anything? If there's no current system right now in the field, right now Lockheed Martin is working on a GPS-based system. It's more of a global kind of system. It's more to track uh, air to ground combat. It's not for individual soldiers. This is more individual to close combat, so soldiers don't shoot each other. It's not a location-based system kind of. It's more a coordination system. In other words, for your point, if, if, if there's a soldier in the way, it'll fly and go from. Yes. It will notify soldier B, let them know he's being targeted, and would have greater. And it will let Studio 1 know in his earpiece or in a LEZ kind of indicator, he's targeting a Studio in that direction. Uh, what range are you trying to make your system be able to handle? What? This what? is one of the things we had to train from the Cinema Design 1, because the system we used for Cinema Design 1 was a Bluetooth based system, kind of. It used the same frequency rate as a Bluetooth, and Bluetooth cannot exceed no more than 100 meters, like you were saying earlier. That's for the next Bluetooth uh, system. So we needed some system that was more directional and I had a higher power and we aimed for 25, 25 yards or 23 meters. Mm -hmm. So effective range is close combat. It's not for a long range sniper range kind of system. It's more for close combat, 25 meters or less. So across the room, what kind of distances? The cross, this room is about 12 feet. Mm -hmm. Maybe double that. Yes. 
Have you like considered the generation due to like bigger like jungle, right? Like have you considered the generation when you're in the jungle, like you have all these leaves and stuff? Right. What this is, is another the, the, the another change we have to make. This is where we have to use a power amplifier to make the signal to boost the signal so it can go to some basic amplifier. What's the power you putting out right now? The original system we had was when it came out of the device it had a one meter watt. One so we had to boost it to at least one watt. Okay. So it could go through crows and some basic obstacles. It will not go through walls, but a wall will probably start to bullet also. But we need to make it so that when the user is using it, that it can receive the signal and process the signal. How about the energy processing the signal? That question can be seen as I do, and we regulate this thing. <laughs> we need to, that was one of the feedback I got from this scene as I want. We create a, some kind of a local network between the beacon and the tracker so that if they're separated from more than five minutes, it will wipe out the memory, but the enemy cannot use it. So we also made the programming uh, time limited, so every morning it will need to be reprogrammed. And we also made it so that it's frequency harmful, so that the enemy cannot lock on your signal. And it's using kind of a, a spread spectrum, ra random waveform, non-periodic timetable, so that it, it's not static at a time base, and the frequency range, so the enemy cannot see it. Have you looked at the power consumption? We've done some basic power consumption. Right now we have a, a battery that's kicking out about 800 million. No, 800 million. We may be able to use it for a full day. How do you do your how did you do your information direction on antenna? That was the main challenge. Because there's a ton of technologies out there for directing antennas. And what we found that was effective for us, we had to go back to our old design, was a Yagi antenna. It has like multiple, multiple conductors being reflected to give you a more directional pattern. So that's what we have right now. So we have some PCB board out there that shows that pattern. And we're using a more omnidirectional PCB trace antenna for the beacons. And those work. But we're just having some package issues right now. Or just on the beacon, what sort of beacon were you using? The beacon, we call it a beacon just because of what it does, but it's actually our own PC design. And we're using an NSP430 and the CC1101 conceiver, and also a TI-CC1190 for the power amplification. So it's our own design. It's not a, it's not an off-the-shelf beacon. So we have to come up with our own design. It's a radio detector, for example. Yes, it's working as a PC. It's using the industrial frequency range of 300 to 1200. And right now, the base frequency we're using to lock it on before it starts doing the piece of copying is 868 meter. That's the base frequency. Okay, thank you, Mr. Carlos.